What's going on everybody? Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and whatever time it is, and welcome back to yet another video with you, man. Immersion Holic, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a redo of our Carthage Faction Overview for the Divided Tempera Overhaul Mod for Total War Room 2. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we are rechecking out the Carthaginian campaign for the grand campaign, that is, of course. Um, this is for two reasons. One, it is in preparation of our upcoming Carthaginian campaign that will be releasing in the same week that this faction overview video will be released. So, uh, probably about a few days after this overview goes up, you guys will be seeing that being released, so make sure you go ahead and check that out. If you're watching this far off in the future, I'll be sure to drop a link down below for you guys to come along and check it out and join us on the wild ride that is our Carthaginian campaign. It's been a lot of fun in recording so far. And then the second reason is that the first faction overview I ever did for the channel was Carthage. And admittedly, it wasn't my best work and we didn't go into extreme details about the units. I talked about some of the good units and their uh, stats, but that was back when I was doing military rosters where I wouldn't show you the actual units. So, we are going to redo the campaign overview section and we are going to go into the military view for military land units and for naval units. That's where we'll actually be looking at some ships. That's going to be a lot of fun. So this overview will be a lot more detailed than my previous faction overview. And in addition, I've actually revised the difficulty rating and overall verdict for Carthage, at least in my opinion. Um, there hasn't been a lot of actual changes for Carthage, but there has been changes to the campaign overall since I uh, did a, my previous Carthaginian overview. So, um, feel free to go check out that previous overview if you would like. It is still relevant in my opinion, however, some things have changed and I think the difficulty rating has been appropriately adjusted to kind of reflect the campaign difficulty a little bit better. So without any further ado, let's get into it. So everybody, let's start off with the Carthaginian buffs that all of E3 Dynasty share. We have the Phoenician Trade Heritage buff, which gives plus 10% wealth from all commerce buildings. Very nice buff to have, and obviously pushes you to have a commerce orientated economy. Notice that it says com commerce buildings, that is not including trade. Trade is separate from commerce buildings. Um, although trade is always going to be very nice to have as well. Then we also have the Diverse Armies buff, which gives you a minus 50% mercenary and up elephant upkeep cost, which is very nice because your armies will be made entirely out of mercenaries, and some of your armies will probably have elephants, although I don't recommend doing it for all of them, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So moving on to the individual dynasties of Carthage, you have the Hanadid Dynasty. The Hanadid Dynasty is focused on diplomacy, using mercenaries, and having a little bit of extra movement. Now why is that? Well, you have the Statesman buff, you have diplomatic bonuses with all factions. So generally diplomacy should be easy for you, especially if you're playing on normal difficulty, which keep in mind is how I conduct these faction overviews. I am, I am doing this under the assumption you're playing on normal difficulty for any faction you're trying. Because that's what I recommend for all casual DI players and even uh, regular DI players who just prefer to have diplomacy in their game. Next up, we have the Pioneers buff which increases movement for all forces. So not just your army but also your navies. Very nice buff to have. It's always nice to be able to outmaneuver your enemies and having buffs like this will obviously help you do that. However, you then have the Military Underdogs debuff, which increases non-mercenary recruitment costs. So basically, this is kind of pushing you to continue that agenda of using mercenaries over proper Carthaginian, aka Phoenician soldiers, um, because they'll be more expensive. And so obviously being a large empire, you can't afford to constantly be using high quality troops or high costing troops, especially all across your empire. You need to try and focus a little bit more on what's going to be more efficient. So that's it for the Hananid Dynasty. Going to the Maganid Dynasty. They are a little bit more focused on using Carthaginian troops, less public order issues. However, you also have less tax because you have the military reforms buff, which decreases upkeep costs for all non-mercenary units. 
Thus, you're generally uh, encouraged to use proper Carthaginian troops, or this also applies to AOR units. So you might want to levy troops from local areas that you move into, um, just as a little bit of an example there. You then have the Iron Fist buff, which increases resistance to foreign occupation. Not a bad uh, buff to have at all. Then you have the debuff of uh, corruption, which decreases your tax rate. Now, this is going to sting a little bit. Um, and in my opinion, out of all of the factions you could play as, the Magnet Dynasty out of the three is probably the lesser of the three. Um, that's just my personal preference. It kind of depends on how you like to play um, Carthage. But having that decreased tax rate bu uh, debuff. That's really going to hurt because tax is such a big deal in terms to your income. Um, it almost doesn't matter what kind of economy you go with. If you have low tax, then you're going to struggle. Uh, and then combining a lower tax rate alongside empire maintenance and whatnot, that's where you're going to see your economy kind of plummet a little. So um, that's just my personal opinion on that, though. We then have the Barkid Dynasty, the Barkids, of course. Um, we have the agricultural reforms buff where they're getting increased agricultural income. Pretty uh, straightforward, nothing too special, but it does help. You then have the popular support buff, which gives you public order bonuses from Punic culture. This is kind of encouraging you to try and solidify your hold on regions where you have cities. You might have a few provinces, well you do indeed have provinces, where you don't have all of these cities under your control inside of them. So to try and help you there, you need to really try and focus on increasing your Punic culture. Because you get that extra little boost for public order bonuses. Um, so that way you don't have to station troops in every single region under your control to try and keep public order down. Um, so generally speaking, the Barakid Dynasty is kind of focused on centralizing its position. Speaking of that though, you have Punic Faith as your debuff, which gives you moderate diplomatic penalties with Latin, Iberian, and Greek cultures. So not only are we trying to centralize our positions by increasing your Punic culture, but you're probably going to be at war on multiple fronts and you're going to struggle for allies. Because Latin obviously means Rome, the Iberian uh, cultures are obviously all going to be in Iberia, so you're going to have um, very few friends in Iberia, if any at all. And then Greek cultures in general are going to be hostile towards you. So that's going to be a little bit of a bummer for you. Um, because you are bordered by multiple Greek factions to your east. You have the Ptolemies, you have Cyrenaica, you then have the um, old Greek city-states that, you know, sometimes do survive. Uh, then you have Syracuse and whatnot. So that is going to hurt you a little bit. You might struggle to get trade when you're playing as your barkets, but we'll talk about that a little bit more very shortly. So without any further ado, let's go into the part one section of this video where we'll talk about the grand campaign situation for the Barkid Dynasty while you play as Carthage. Okay, everybody, here we are on the grand campaign map for Carthage. We start off with a whopping 14 cities. That is the most that any faction has on turn one in the Grand Campaign, that is. Um, followed very closely by the Ptolemy Dynasty in Egypt and then the Seleucids. And I don't believe there's any other factions that have quite as many cities under their direct control. The Seleucids probably have more if you include their client states. Well, they do in fact have more if you include client states. However, I'm just talking about direct cities. Um, you then start off with two provinces completely under your control and then you have another province which is technically under con your control although you have only one city inside of it and the rest belong to your client states. Um, we have three armies. The first army is in Carthage itself led by your leader who at this point for us is Hannibal. Now keep in mind this is not THE Hannibal that crossed the Alps. This is his grandfather actually. Um, the Grand Campaign starts in 278 BC, so it's still quite a while before the Hannibal is around. So what we have is Hannibal's grandfather, who is leading the Barca dynasty, and then we have his son Hamilcar. This is Hamilcar, who will, who will be the father of Hannibal, so as long as you let the little fella live, he will get Hannibal a little bit later on in the campaign. Depending on how many turns per year you have your campaign set to, 
Um, Hannibal might not come until around turn 150 or so, to be honest. It could take quite a while. Um, but if you're playing on the standard four turns per year, then it might be a little bit less than that. Uh, but either way, we're playing as the Barca Dynasty. As I said, you start off with Hannibal, 27 years old, married to Lissa, 25, and then you have your son Hamilcar, who was two years old at the time. Um, there will be more children as well, depending on how your spouses get along. Um, like I said, we have the one army inside of Carthage itself right here. We then have your second army in Panormus in northwestern Sicily. And then we have one more army all the way over here in the city of Mastia in Iberia, or what will become New Carthage eventually. Um, and that's it. That's all your military forces at the beginning of your campaign. You have no navies. This is a new change um, in the 1.3 update. So your army compositions are different and you have no navy and you also have no agents. Although you can recruit agents on turn one. You can get spies and you can get dignitaries. Just can't get champions instantly. Um, so you can rectify that pretty quickly if you like. I do recommend trying to get um, most uh, of your agents as quick as you can. However, you do have a lot to do because like I said, you have 14 cities. Um, and so let's obviously have a quick look at where they are. So we'll start from the west and work out work our way east. So um, obviously we hold territory in the Maghreb region in North Africa, aka modern day Morocco. You have the city of Tingis and the city of Siga. Both are in the province of Mauritania. Um, you then also have the Gaetulians to your southwest who are very neutral. And they're actually quite friendly towards you. You don't have any diplomacy with them, but on turn one, they will take trade and non-aggression, and then they will be quite happy and generally won't attack you unless you're looking very weak, and especially if you're playing on hard difficulty. Um, north of Tingis, we have the city of Gadir. It's your most western Iberian possession inside the province of Baetica alongside two other cities, Eplasia and Kartuba to the north. Um, you then have Mastia, as I said earlier. This is in the province of Hispania. You have Mastia and then Ibosum, which is the Balearic Islands. This is where you will get your Balearic Slingers. If we get up to level two of any kind of settlement, you get your Balearic Slingers as an AOR unit. So you may want to upgrade those as quick as you can. You can also get mercenaries as well in these neighboring regions. Um, can we get it here in Mastia on turn 1? Let's double check. Yes, we can. Right here, you can get Balearic Slingers. Um, heading back down towards Africa, though, we have the city of Iol. Iol is in the province of Numidia, and it is that um, funny little province I told you about where you can actually install edicts because you have all of the other cities under your control through clients. You have the Mesesli and the Massili, to yourself. The Massili own the city of Capsa, and the Massesili own uh, Kithan right up here, and then they own the city of Demidia as well. So because all four of those cities are in the same province as Iol, you can use your edicts. Um, so it might be a nice idea for you to try and use your Bread and Games edict early on here, try and increase public order there, because it's not really worth sending an army or a general just to this one little city in this massive region because you don't control it all. So moving on from the city of Iol, we, wor we work our way east. We have Carthage at the heart of your empire, of course. North of Carthage though, we have Sardinia and Corsica. Sardinia has the city of Corrales, which is a walled settlement. And this is of course in the province of Corsica and Sardinia. Um, both of the islands have only one settlement on each of them. Up here to the north though, you have the city of Alalia. Um, this is where you get your iron from though, and actually I should have mentioned that before um, For your other province, I mean for your other cities in Iol you have wood and then in Gadir you have wine um, That's it for your western possessions So out of all of your cities in the west You only have two that give you actual resources, which is kind of disappointing I would have liked to have seen Iberia especially be a little bit more lucrative um, Maybe even Mastia have like silver mines or something like that, but anyway um, uh, Corrales has no resources, the city of, of uh, Alalia does, um, and it's one province that's under your control. So again, you can use your edicts as you wish. Moving east, we have Sicily, where you have two out of three cities inside of the province of Sicilia, aka Sicily. 
Um, we have Panormus, which has fish, and you then have Akragus, which has grain. Um, it previously did have iron, but it doesn't seem to anymore. That's the interesting change. I definitely recall it having iron, though. But anyway, that's your uh, Sicilian possessions. Like I said, we have Carthage down here in the center. Carthage is in the province of Africa, which is entirely under your control. And is one of those cities, I mean, one of those provinces where you can uh, begin using edicts straight away. You then have the city of Thapsos to your direct south, which produces fish. You then have the city of LPQY, aka Leptis Magna, I believe this is actually is historically. Um, you have grain there, so obviously hinting towards the um, bountiful food available in, in North Africa at the time. And then you have the city of Euphranta, your most far eastern possession, uh, bordering Cyrene, aka Cyrenaica, way out here. You're also bordering the Nasamones down here, and you're um, bordering the Garamantians. We have the city of Garama and the city of Tidamensi, which actually also has animal levers right here. Um, what's the actual resource for that called? Uh, producing leather. So, same thing. Um, you might want to come down and get this leather. It's actually a pretty nice resource to have. Pretty rare on the Grand Campaign map. Um, but do be aware, as soon as you get off the coast and head inland, um, you'll see all of this yellow right here. That's because it's desert. You're going to take attrition as you come out here. Uh, so that is going to be pretty rough for your armies. But, I mean, you can try to follow these little snaky roads out there. But you'll still suffer attrition. So uh, might not be worth fighting the Garamantians. But anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Speaking on diplomacy, we have a war. You have war with Epirus at the beginning of the campaign. However, Epirus is essentially a non-issue for you. Especially if you're playing on normal difficulty, Epirus will 9.99999 times out of 10 get overrun by Rome and get wiped out within 15 to 20 turns. If they survive more than 20 turns in your campaign, then I would be shocked. Um, I've done a lot of test campaigns as Carthage, I'm doing my main one now. Every single time I play as Carthage, I see Epirus getting wiped. I have heard that it is possible for Epirus to beat Rome, but... I sincerely doubt you'll see that in your campaigns. Um, yeah, just Epirus is going to get destroyed. I wouldn't worry about being at war with them at all. Oh, actually, let's go back. Um, like I said, you have the Basili and the Masesili to your southwest down here in the far bright green. They are your client states. Um, do we have any other trade? The only trade agreement that you have is with Rome, of all factions. Rome starts off very friendly towards you. Um, you can actually get an alliance with Rome on turn one. You can offer them a defensive alliance and they are interested. However, it's not really worth getting. You can try to get it if you like, but there is a hard-coded system in the Grand Campaign that basically tailors Rome to hate you and then declare war on you. Um, you Rome does not have to take Sicily um, in order for them to declare war on you. Previously, as soon as you occupied the city of Syracuse, that automatically made Rome hate you and declare war on you. Now, you'll still have that same event happen if you take Syracuse. However, if you avoid taking Syracuse, you will still get Rome declaring war on you. It is very random. And to be honest, I kind of don't like that. I think it's a little bit annoying, but I mean, it is what it is. Um, it is trying to recreate historical uh, authenticity and events. Basically, if you're playing as Carthage, no matter what you do, at some point you will be at war with Rome. However, that does not mean that you can't get peace with Rome and that you can't somehow cozy them back into being friendly. It is possible if you throw a lot of money at them, you declare war on their enemies, you always release their troops when you beat their armies. Um, you, there are ways to kind of manipulate the AI into being friendly with you. So, expect war with Rome. It is it is possible to get them to be your friend again after you get into war with them, but extremely hard to pull off. And, in my opinion, sometimes not really worth it. Um, it's only worth it if you're trying to pull off a little bit of an ahistorical campaign, perhaps, or if you would like to save Rome for the late game, which I think would be a lot more fun uh, to try and do that if you can. Imagine playing as Carthage and you're, fight and you're facing off Marian legionnaires 
in the middle of Sicily. That would be pretty epic and hard to deal with. But anyway, um, that is your diplomacy on turn one. You have no other pre-made agreements. You do have the Gaituli to your west over here who are very friendly and are looking to get trade and non-aggression with you. Um, for whatever reason, if you're playing as the Barca Dynasty like I generally recommend and what I see people doing the most as well, um, you will see hostility coming in from Cyrenaica. They'll actually declare war on you. Um, the Ptolemies also don't like you early on, although you can get trade with them pretty easily, especially if you help them in the war against Cyrenaica. Um, the core Greek cities uh, up here in Greece won't like you. Uh, other Greek cities such as Massalia also won't like you, won't want to get trade with you unless you're helping them fight their enemies. Although that's kind of hard to pull off with Massalia. Um, they're kind of snobbish up there. Iberians, you can get trade with many of the Iberian factions, but none of them like you and none of them will get non-aggression unless you really influence them, aka uh, by send them gifts and declare war on the enemies, stuff like that. Um, so generally with diplomacy, the only kind of reliable thing you have is your Numidian allies. And to be honest, they're not always so reliable. The Numidians can declare war on you um, and they can screw you over while you're in the middle of war, especially when you're fighting Rome. Um, that's when you'll see the uh, client states that are under your control when you're at your weakest rebel against you and declare war. I can't guarantee it will happen to you, but it is a possibility. So you might want to just early on betray them, solidify your position in Africa, and then uh, feel a little bit more secure at home. That's kind of up to you, but um, that is your diplomacy on turn one. Diplomacy kind of can go in any direction as you move forward in the campaign and you can influence things. Perhaps we can do a video on how to influence AI and nations in the future, but generally speaking, your diplomacy is going to be pretty hard-headed if you're playing as the Barca Dynasty. And even then, if you're playing as the other dynasties, uh, you still won't get all that many differences in the campaign. Two minor things to add on to your diplomacy as well as the Garamantians will almost always declare war on you and your Numidian allies. Pain in the butt to fight and they will often attack your coastal possessions. So you'll probably want to get an army down here to Leptis as soon as you can. And then you have um, the Illyrians, you have the Deorsi faction up here that you actually can see on turn one. They will take trade with you. So you might want to get an admiral and uh, kind of cruise up the Adriatic coast and then go east towards uh, the Black Sea and try and get some trade with, uh, with other barbarians because they don't have any cultural aversion towards you, at least nothing too significant. So could be worth considering. Um, getting back to Carthage, uh, let's talk about your population so your population overall is looking pretty fantastic and there's one key ingredient to that and that is you have 14 cities on turn one so um you do you definitely have a lot of variety you have a lot of options in what kind of armies you want to recruit however there is one kind of thing you need to be aware of and that is that for example if we click on Carthage itself and we check out the population you will see the Phoenician social class, your um, basically nobility or core Carthaginians, are pretty limited in number. They're only 1200 on turn one. That will increase over time, however, it increases slowly and it is not reliable. Thus, you will not be able to recruit many armies with just core Carthaginian troops. Uh, if we go to recruitment, you can see these troops. For example, Carthaginian hoplites come from the Phoenician social class. Yes, I can recruit, what, uh, six units on turn one, but then that's going to drain all of the Phoenicians out of Carthage, at least all of the recruitable Phoenicians. Um, what you want to do instead is try to use units that come from your subject social class. For example, Libyan hoplites. Not as good as your Carthaginians, but they're pretty close, and you have 20,000 of them available on turn one just in the city of Carthage alone. Uh, if we go up to Corrales, for example, we're going to see a similar pattern. 1,200 Phoenicians are available, 21,000 uh, subject people are available for you. And so this is a pattern that you'll see throughout your entire empire, and the majority of your cities will have a large subject population, a minor Libby Phoenician population, very limited Phoenicians, and then a somewhat limited foreigners population, although it's still pretty solid for foreigners, 
especially as you begin um, taking over new settlements that don't have any Punic culture in them. For example, when you march into southern Italy, you will want to have your armies be composed primarily of mercenary units that are foreigners. So that way you can replenish them pretty easily. Um, however, down here in Sicily, you will still have a pretty healthy mix of your population um, depending on what city you're in. For example, once you take Syracuse, depending on the cultural balance there, um, you might have way more foreigners than you would of your standard population. Um, but overall, you have very few issues with your public order. The only one issue is that you will struggle to maintain armies composed entirely of your core Carthaginian population. Um, that is intentional and it's kind of reminiscent of the Spartan situation in which the Spartan uh, nation has very limited true Spartans they can recruit. However, luckily for you as Carthage, you do not rely on Carthaginians to make up the bulk of your armies. Of your armies. If anything, they are just a core kind of elite section of your army that you should keep in reserve and only use when absolutely necessary or when you're perhaps fighting in Africa and know you can replace your Carthaginian losses pretty easily. Um, although you could always try to take a general and march in between settlements in Africa or wherever um, and recruit just core Carthaginian troops. I will try to do that in my campaign just for the sake of it. It could be fun. Um, but it's going to be a little bit difficult to maintain because as soon as you take any losses when you're overseas, say in, in Italy for example, um, you're not going to be able to replenish your troops. It's going to take a long time. Um, so you will have to change your army over time. Which is kind of annoying, but something to keep in mind. Overall, your population is looking great. Um, speaking of great, your economy. Your economy is looking very, very solid. Um, your economy is very com commerce-driven and trade-driven. Both are two separate things, keep in mind, the DEI. Um, you can opt for industry and agriculture if you like, especially when you have provinces such as Africa um, that do have extra food inside of, inside of them from fish and grain. Uh, but you have a lot of cities in the province of Africa that can produce food, combining that alongside with fish, of course. Um, and then you can try to sell uh, your food if you like. You use the uh, export agricultural uh, edict. Where is it? Here it is. You can use it and get a massive boost to your economy, especially if you're playing as the Barricades. Uh, it might not be the best thing for you to do early on, but if you tailor your building composition right, um, especially now that we have six slots available in cities that do have that many, uh, for example, Carthage will get to six slots, then you can um, really get your economy flowing in kind of any category that you want. Generally speaking, though, trade and a, and a a commerce driven economy are your core kind of tenants that's what is expected of you and that's probably what the easiest option is for you what I would recommend um, overall looking great you have some resources available not a lot though especially considering how many cities you have under your control but you have some um, resources nearby for example you have olives right here at Iplacia, Ebora has iron, uh, city of Ars has uh, uh, silver uh, Numancia has copper, so you can get some pretty good resources once you begin to move into Iberia. Um, in my opinion though, Iberia is still pretty lackluster in its resources because I think it should have more. For example, Kartuba should have something, I think. Uh, Mastia should have something as well. Um, I mean, it's not terrible in Iberia, it's just not as powerful as it is made out to be historically. That's my biggest kind of gripe with Iberia as a whole in DEI um, but you know that's just kind of how it works out and it can be a very lucrative uh, province to have uh, or area of the map to have if you control all of Iberia but it's not really going to make you a lot of cash very very quickly it's going to take time to build up and to, to design your provinces in a way that are beneficial to you but anyway ladies and gentlemen that's it for the Carthaginian campaign overview section of this video We've talked about your diplomacy, your economy, your population, and your overall starting position. Overall, it's looking pretty solid. You are kind of stretched um, pretty thin. Playing on harder difficulties, you're really going to struggle as Carthage, in my opinion. But again, please do keep in mind 
This faction overview is under the assumption you're playing on normal difficulty. Thus, um, you should have some diplomacy options. Whereas if you're playing on hard or very hard or above, diplomacy just goes out the window and everyone's going to declare war on you. That's kind of what happens. Um, and when you're playing as Carthage, that's very hard to handle. But anyway, let's go into the part two section of this video where we'll check out the Navy of the Carthaginian roster and the land forces. So let's do it. Alrighty everybody, here we are at the naval battle section of this video. I know it's pretty rare that we actually cover the navies of uh, the factions that we do overviews on. That's because the majority of factions usually only have about three to like five, maybe six ships. And it's all like the same kind of unit, like an axe raider for the barbarians available in like three different ships and maybe like a slinger or something so um carthage isn't amazing with their navy which is kind of surprising since they are carthage uh, renowned for their navy and naval prowess um but they're not bad and so i thought we may as well take at least a couple minutes out of this overview to check them out i'm not going to go through the stats of every single ship that we have here just going to give you guys some general highlights and a few close-ups of the units so, as usual, I've split up the um, military forces. I keep going to say army, but this isn't your army, this is your navy. <laughs> um, I split up your forces into different categories. And you can see off the bat, you have variety, which is very, very nice. Um, some uh, navies are focused on melee combat, some are focused on ramming, others on skirmishing. Looking at you, Egypt. Um, whereas here for Carthage, you have a little bit of everything. Um, you don't have anything that is the best, quote-unquote, but you do have some very good stuff. For example, right here, we have your Marines. Um, and the different ships here don't demonstrate different units. They all are the exact same units with the exact same stats. The only difference is that um, some of these ships are bigger than others, and they also have projectile weapons. For example, um, this right here, this 140-man... Apparently, Pantera's unit, or basically your Marines, that are uh, 140 men, ship health total of 880, which isn't terrible, it's pretty decent. Um, they have a Scorpion, as you can see right here at the front. So they will start to shoot pretty far away. Unfortunately, as you can see here, it does not show you the radius of that actual Scorpion. Um, so that is going to be a little bit of a hidden way that you could get a few extra kills. It won't swing the battle in your way necessarily, but it might kill a few of the enemy's marines before they engage with your own, thus giving your men the slight edge over the enemy. Kind of depends on their ships as well. Um, but then we also have the same thing for this tower right here. Um, the tower itself shoots out projectiles and you have a scorpion down below as well. So not only are you paying for more men, but you also get a bigger ship with more health, obviously, and you get two sets of projectiles flying out. And can we just admire the amazing textures on this ship? Oh my goodness, that looks disgusting. That looks terrifying. Could you imagine that just coming at you head on at your ship? Like, that looks evil, dude. <laughs> oh, that looks incredible. Very, very nice. Um, the Marines themselves also all look pretty badass. They're basically the equivalent of almost Roman Legionnaires, really. Um, if we look at their stats, this is the stats all of your melee troops use uh, on ships. You have a melee attack of 10, a weapon damage of 28, melee defense of 16, and then an armor of 35. That armor of 35 is very substantial, very strong. Um, and like I said, we're getting into Legionnaire territory. You have the big hoplite style shields, you have the cuirasses, you have a little bit of chainmail, I believe, on some of the men. Um, so, the, your Marines, while they're not necessarily the best in the world, they are very, very good. Um, and then comparing your melee troops to Roman troops, I believe they are the exact same statistically, except for one thing, which is that the Romans have like one extra point of attack. Um, depending on what ship they use, but I'm just talking about like the standard Roman Marines that you will end up fighting. Um, then over here we have another section of just these four ships. Uh, these are your skirmishers. You have a javelin ship which only goes up to 80 men, funnily enough. Not sure why that is, but it is what it is. 
Um, you then have Balearic Slingers over here, and they have the same range as they normally would, range of 215. Then you have Archers, two sets of Archers, both of them are the exact same, except for the size of the ship and the men on board. Um, but, yeah, that's it. You can do long range skirmishing with your Slingers, you can try to draw the enemy away with them, you can try to use Archers instead. Uh, I typically prefer to use Archers, but I mean, that's just me. Uh, or you could use close range, fast moving skirmishes or javelin men, of course. So, very interesting stuff. Um, like I said, gives you the option to basically take on the enemy navy how you like. We then also have a siege uh, unit here, only the one. Um, you get a ballista unit, 140 men are with this ballista unit. So, not only do you have very nice long range uh, damage potential, but you do have. Um, Marines here. They are listed as Greek Marines, which is interesting. Your other Marines are not, which is why I believe their statistics are different because these guys have only an armor listed of 30 rather than 35. Do they look a little bit more Greek than the others? No, they're looking pretty punic to me. So there might be a little bit of an oversight there. Perhaps they um, are supposed to be supposed to be the same as the other Carthaginian Marines. But yeah, they are. Uh, over here on the left side, you'll see it says Greek Marines in brackets, and uh, yeah, only 30 armor instead of 35, but still pretty strong ship, not bad at all. We didn't have the fire pot ships. Fire pot ships seem to be very hit or miss to me. I'll have them ram the enemy ship multiple times, and the fire pots, which are dangling right here, won't detonate. Other times, they'll wipe out a ship in a single uh, charge. So use these at your own discretion. It's kind of up to you. Uh, I don't really recommend them. Then the other thing we need to talk about is your potential flagships. These are the ships that your admirals will be using. Obviously you have three different sets. You have one set which is um, a archer unit, so a little bit more for minor navies doing patrolling along your coast perhaps. You have a scorpion on there. Uh, we then have your other ship which is kind of the same deal except it has marines instead of archers. You have the scorpion again and then we also have the tower that will shoot our projectiles. So. Um, a little bit more upscale, I would recommend you get at least that level, but what I really would recommend is getting this big bad boy. What a heifer. <laughs> look how big this lad is. This is very impressive. Not only does it look amazing, like look at this, oh my gosh, the detail. Are you kidding me? How old is Rome 2 guys? What? It's just, wow. Very impressive. The DEI team has done amazing work. I wonder how much of them, uh, of their work has gone into the ships. But either way, I'm just flabbergasted. I'm very impressed. Um, but anyway, I would recommend this ship because in case you've missed it, it is quite clearly your biggest ship. Um, if we bring it over here to next to this ship, it is similar in size. But it is still way bigger. Uh, it has a bigger tower, has a bigger ship bigger everything and ladies and gentlemen I know it might pain me but might pain some of you guys to hear but size does matter and when it comes to naval warfare in the ancient world that is absolutely true because the bigger your ship the more ship health it has the more health it has the more it can withstand um, and obviously having your admiral on a ship like this is going to be extremely important um, this is the one ship which I think will give you a really big edge over Romans when you're fighting them because you have 2,000 HP and you have 180 men on board. That is massive. This ship can take on multiple at once if needed in terms of boarding uh, actions. You might get boarded from two different sides. Doesn't matter. This ship can handle it. Um, it's unlikely that the AI would do that. Don't get me wrong. It's not going to be easy and you shouldn't throw this into melee just kind of carelessly. Um, but having a ship with 2,000 HP is very nice. Not every faction, not every faction in the game can say that they have 2,000 ship HP. Uh, I know Egypt can, I believe some of the Didoki factions might be able to, but I know the Romans cannot. I believe they max out at either 1,800 or 1,600, which still gives you an edge over them. Um, so this ship is going to be very expensive, it will hit your income, but in my opinion, it is way better to use this than one of these other two smaller ships. Unless you have like a campaign reason, for example, you don't have enough money to support a navy um, around New Carthage. So perhaps you just want your admiral to use this small ship 
try and patrol around, make sure the pesky pirates can't raid your cities. It's up to you. Um, but um, that is my opinion on the Carthaginian Navy. Overall, it's very solid, but it's not as amazing as you might think it would be, being that this is Carthage. That's it for the Carthaginian Naval Overview. Overall looking pretty good. Um, now, let's jump on into the Land Army Overview of the Carthaginian Republic. Alrighty everybody, here we are with the Army Overview section of this video for Carthage. We just checked out the Navy very briefly and here we are on the battlefield just outside of the city of Carthage. Actually, if we go way down here at the bottom of the map, um, you can see Carthage way out here in the distance. Um, so very cool. Uh, I know some people have requested I try to do prettier battle maps for um, these faction overviews. I do appreciate the reasoning behind that, but what I prefer to do is instead um, go to locations uh, as close to the capital cities of these uh, factions as possible or just in iconic places where they will be fighting and this is obviously in the heartland of Carthage um, I have been posting on discord a fair bit over the last couple weeks but in case you have missed it I've been relatively sick recently um, so if my voice is sounding a little bit more croaky than normal or um, if you guys notice that it sounds different in different aspects of the video that's because I've had to record this over several days um, I have to record in small segments of like 15 to 30 minutes at a time which is not helpful for a video that's probably going to be well over an hour long uh, although I will try to cut it down but anyway let's move on from that we have a massive roster to get through this isn't even your entire Carthaginian roster um, obviously it doesn't include AOR units you get access to but I had to cut out I believe two unit no three units um, two of our elephant units I've had to cut out in addition to a Libyan slinger and then I believe a Libyan javelin unit as well but those both units were very levy tier um, but I ran out of room to troops that I could have in my army in a battle and that's how I show off these armies to you guys so um, you won't be missing anything just a couple levy units and your other variants of the elephants so what I did for the elephants is get you guys the best elephant that Carthage can get. Um, but basically the other elephants are the same. They just don't have the towers with uh, javelin on top. So talk about that a little bit more later. Let's, as always, um, go ahead and start with your general's bodyguard. You have many different options as Carthage for your bodyguards as you do for your entire roster. Options, options, options. Um, however, I chose to go with the Carthaginian General's Bodyguard because it's your most obviously dedicated bodyguard unit. Um, and it's actually a really, really solid unit. I really would recommend you try to use this early on in your campaign. You don't necessarily need the Sacred Band Cavalry that you get access to for your generals. Um, I believe you get the early tier Sacred Band Cav and the late tier as a general. These guys are still excellent. Only 100 men in their unit, unfortunately, but stats across the board are fantastic they are a little bit slower uh, than what you might like but that's because they're just so good they're very heavily armored amazing attack and defense good charge um, these guys can basically do everything except skirmish <laughs> um, of course so very nice bodyguard to start off with and as per the rest of the Carthaginian roster these guys look amazing and you're going to see that as a bit of a pattern throughout the rest of the roster. Anyway, let's look at these skirmishes that Carthage has access to. Okay, everybody, here we are checking out your skirmishes. We have the Libyan oh, Peltas. Um, pretty low tier, but they are still pretty useful. And you'll have a mercenary variant of these guys as well, which is mercenary Numidian Peltas. Um, these guys are a little bit better in melee attack and defense, so you can use them in a fight if you really, really need someone but I would try to avoid it. Um, and just a little FYI, we do have a massive roster, so obviously I'm not gonna go into too much in depth uh, about every single unit, but I will cover units I feel like uh, that are worth mentioning. Um, and then here we actually do have the mercenary Numidians. I forgot that I brought them. Um, we should actually swap these two around because your Libyan Peltas are better, whereas the Numidian Javelinmen 
aren't as good. Although I believe we also have a Numidian Palatus specific unit as well. Um, which is a mercenary unit though. But these guys are pretty levy like. Um, unfortunately they don't even have something like stalk ability or anything. Um, and their melee attack and defense is pretty abysmal. Ready. We didn't have the Libby Phoenician Paltus. These guys are really, really nice, so I really enjoy um, using them in online battles. I recommend you try to do so as well if you can. Um, just fantastic Paltus unit. Has solid attack and defense. It almost acts as like a bit of a Furio Spear unit with Javelins in a way. Um, especially with that armor of 30. Very, very juicy. Um, mercenary Balearic Slingers. I mean... Do I need to talk about them? They're just some of the best slingers in the game. They used to be the best. However, I think I need to do a best slinger video in DEI because a lot of the barbarian factions now have slingers that can rival these guys, if not outperform them. So I'll need to do some comparisons and see what happens with them. Uh, but you can get them as a mercenary unit or you can get them as an AOR unit. So um, very nice to have the multiple options available to you. Um, obviously, you need to recruit them from near the Balearic Islands area, though. So in western, I mean in eastern Iberia, the, uh, the, the western part of your empire, though. We then have Libyan archers. Libyan archers are your bottom tier archer unit, but they are there, so it's nice that you do have the option. But then you jump up from them to your Carthaginian archers. These guys are very, very nice. Um, their range is amazing, just as standard 165. Um, but their armor is at 25, an attack of 10, defense of 13. These guys aren't something to be necessarily underestimated. Um, and they have a shield on their back, so that will help them in skirmishing against the enemy. Just overall, they're actually quite impressive. They will deal some damage, mainly use them as a flanking force if you need to use them in melee. Um, but yeah actually quite impressive and it gives you the ability to use flaming shot in combat so that's obviously going to help you out as well um i have once again favorited your different units that will go into different categories so you'll see in the unit cards down here we have number one uh, or group one and then group two group one represents all of the units that you get after the furious reforms Number two is all of the units you get after the Thorax reforms. Um, so Carthage uh, adheres to the reforms that the Greeks have, obviously. So you have the Thurios reforms that will occur for the player at Imperium level 3 after you hit turn 50. So you have to be at Imperium level 3 first though. And then you uh, get the Thorax reforms at Imperium level 5 after turn 120. So. Um, some of these units won't be available to you until the late game. You've got to keep that in mind. For example, these Peltas are one such unit. Uh, they don't come in until the end. And for your other skirmishes, you have the um, Libyan Peltas down here. These guys are a Furios unit. Carthaginian Archers are also a Furios unit. Uh, but Furios reforms don't take long. And... Um, it's pretty easy to hit Imperium level 3. I think you even start with Imperium level 3 as Carthage. Uh, it's either 3 or 2 if I remember correctly. So, um, while your skirmishes d look like there isn't a lot of options, you actually do have options. You have Peltas, Slingers, Archers, good AOR mercenary options, and you can even get Crossbowmen once you take over Sicily if you do want to use them. So, um, don't take this... Uh, relatively small looking size in a negative way um, it's not really representative of how powerful your skirmishing capabilities can be especially in conjunction with your other um, more mobile units moving along though we have your spearmen we have a massive contingent of spearmen so what I've done with them is I've divided them into two categories the rear category up here uh, let's do a green line uh, inside this green circle is units that are just either spearmen they are just spearmen that are um, basically standard spearmen nothing too fancy about them I mean some of them are excellent some of them are not so much however the section in front represented by the red arrow here 
is where we have your hoplites. So we'll go over the hoplites first and we'll work our way back to your more generic spears. Um, don't take these groups being separated as that the hoplites are better than the others or vice versa. They both have their strengths and weaknesses. So I just wanted to separate them so you can understand that you do have a pretty vast hoplite contingent. Um, so beginning with that, we start with your very low tier Libyan hoplites. And despite them being low tier, they're actually very useful. They come from your subject social class population. So you can get a lot of them very quickly if you want to recruit them from Carthage or from wherever. Um, they will lose to other hoplites, for example Syracusan hoplites. But put them in the phalanx ability and they will still do very well for you. Um, not as well, however, as Carthaginian hoplites. Um, these guys are going to be hard to kind of maintain as a numerous uh, contingent in your armies because they come from your Phoenician population, which is quite limited throughout your empire. You can get them in numbers if you really try and put in effort. However, as soon as you get them in battle, you're going to take casualties, and if you're in foreign lands, it's going to be hard to replace your Phoenician first class um, soldiers. So these guys are fantastic though. The stats aren't amazing, but for whatever reason, they just perform really, really, really well. Um, I'd like to try and use these guys as a little bit of a elite core or at least a second line core to my army. Um, just really, really nice unit. And obviously they have the phalanx ability, but uh, yeah, overall quite nice. And they have resistance to heat. Uh, they will still take att attrition when you go in the desert though, unfortunately, but they have, they have the discipline role, so they will last a very long time as well. Um, so that's always very nice. Uh, jumping up from them though, we then have mercenary Greek hoplites. Um, these guys are obviously mercenaries and they are Greeks, despite that, um, despite that though, they do not come from your foreigner social class, instead, they come from your subject social class. So because of that, you can actually recruit a crap ton of them. So if you want to do a hoplite based army, try to use these bad boys. Um, they are actually technically better than the Carthaginians in terms of armor. They have 35 compared to 30. And their morale is higher at 46 compared to 39. The Carthaginians just didn't have the class that the Greeks do, at least in mid tier. Or mid to heavy hoplites right here. However, the Carthaginians do take a step back with the Libby Phoenician Peltus. Um, pretty much better across the entire board except for morale and armor compared to the Greeks, which is the same, but all other stats go up for the uh, Libby Phoenicians, although they don't have the discipline trait, which is interesting and worth noting. Doesn't really make a lot of sense since the Carthaginians do. Greeks do, but yeah, Libby Phoenicians don't. So, okay. Um, but they are Libby Phoenician. So because of that, they won't come from the Phoenician social class. They'll be from the Libby Phoenician mix. So your tier two social class. Um, again, not going to be available to you in massive numbers, but it'll be easier to get than the standard Carthaginians. However, um, these guys will not be available until your f uh, first reforms kick in the Furios reforms. Uh, from them, we then move up we are at your command. to your Carthaginian Sacred Band. Uh, a pretty notorious unit for Carthage. Basically the same stats as the Libby Phoenician Hoplite though, except their morale is at 52 and they have the um, Discipline trait. Again, resistant to heat, so that's nice. I believe all of your units are resistant to heat, so it's always a nice little bonus to have. Um, but then, just wow, they look really really amazing very fun unit to use probably not the most practical um you're gonna struggle to fill up your armies with them this is basically um when you have too much of a certain type of population and you kind of just want to make a really strong army just for the sake of it however then we come to possibly the best spear unit that the Carthaginians get access to. Now I included these guys here in the Hoplite um, line because they have the Phalanx ability. Um, not a Pike Wall, you will note it is an actual Phalanx that these guys form. 
despite their shields being different from the standard Hoplon shield that Hoplites use. Um, these guys have incredible stats, especially in regards to defense. Uh, fantastic morale at 56, great armor at 38. These guys are your Triarii of Carthage. They will last an insanely long time in a fight. Um, they have some nice abilities, such as the Phalanx ability. Um, discipline formation, yet again. Uh, resistant to heat. And there was something else. Um, they have the Reform the Line ability, but so do all of your Phalanx units. Not really a big deal, though. It's just a kind of minor change that all Hoplites have been given in the 1.3 update. Um, but just... I could have sworn that these guys used to have these square formation, but they definitely don't now for whatever reason. But yeah, just really, really amazing unit. Looks fantastic, and it's very, very reliable. You're never going to see these guys route easily off the field of battle. They will be the last unit in the Carthaginian army trying to hold the line against the legions of Rome. Um, but that's it for your hoplite specific units or phalanx units. We then go up to your standard kind of spearmen. Well, you have Libyan spearmen. You have these guys here, and then you also have a Thurios unit of them. Um, you have mercenary African levies. These guys are pretty much the same statistically, except no armor. Um, but they do have a javelin, so you, you might want to get them just because they have a javelin. 300 men per unit, so they can slow down the enemy, but not for long. Here's the Libyan Furio Spear unit, obviously available to you after the Thurios reforms. Oh, by the way, um, the... Is it just the one? Yeah. Uh, your Carthaginian Sacred Band are available only after the Thorax reforms as well, so keep that in mind. Um, Libyan Thurio Spear is pretty solid Thurio Spear, but, I mean, not as good as other Thurios units. They're useful. Probably wouldn't recommend them too highly. Um, but you can use them. What I would recommend though is trying to get Gallic units instead. We'll kill them all. So right here we have the mercenary Gallic warriors. Uh, statistically, they are actually worse than the Libyans, technically. Um, that is interesting. I wonder why that is. Let's look at their abilities. They do have expert right. charge defense, but so do the Furious units. They have a javelin, so the only possible thing would be... Um, social class, but these guys come from the, uh, crap, what is it? The subject social class, so I'm not too sure why I put them there. They should be technically behind the Libyan Theory of Space, actually. My mistake. Only just a minor mistake, though. These guys are essentially on the same level. Just a small difference in morale. However, we then jump up to the mercenary Ligurian Spearman. These guys act as a Thurio Spear unit, they're still relatively fast, no Javelin unfortunately, but 300 men per unit, and their stats are a little bit more impressive, uh, especially that armor of 20. Their attack uh, is slightly increased compared to the last couple Spear units, their defense is slightly lower, just by one, um, but besides that, they have other stats that have gone up. And they have that morale of 43, just like the Libyan Thurio Spear unit. So, it's up to you if you want to have a Javelin or not in your Thurio style unit. Definitely look like Ligurian units, so I really love that. Not only do they look Celtic, but they look Ligurian. Ligurians ha uh, often using these small little British slash German kind of army helmets. Or that, I guess that's more of like a British style, that one. Maybe that one's a little bit more German looking, but... um. Uh, you know what I mean with these shields though. They have these very interesting shape shields. You could almost call it a rectangle except it kind of goes off to the left and right side like that. Uh, I can't think of the name of the shape that you would call it. But anyway, Ligurians are definitely quite iconic when it comes to the Celts. Spears! We then have mercenary naked spear throwers. Um, very ferocious in their defense with a defense at 23 which is kind of surprising it's not what you would expect from a unit like this unfortunately because they are naked they don't have any armor so they will die quite quickly especially with skirmisher fire they do um have an immune to fear ability so you can't really scare them off the field and um at the beginning of the battle when they are uh eager to fight when they're not tired at all 
they are impetuous so they'll have a little bit extra morale which is always nice um i'm not really sure what their purpose is other than to reflect carthage getting more gallic units i really would like it if they had perhaps a fear ability to where they instill fear in the enemy um that or perhaps try to boost their attack a little bit but i mean the stats are still great 62 morale is pretty fanatical um defense at 23 attack of 10 Maybe their charge bonus could be increased to 26, maybe 28, something like that to kind of um, reflect their charge style of warfare. Spears at your command. We then have Libby Phoenician Furio Spears. Now, despite these guys being listed as Furio Spears, the DEI website lists these guys as a Forex reform unit. I'm not entirely sure which one is correct, but either way, you do have to wait until at least the Furious reforms to get them, um, if not quite possibly after the Florax reforms. Whenever you do get these guys off, they are very, very nice. Very good, solid uh, Furio style unit. 30 armor, all have a javelin, 300 men. Just very solid. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the kind of Furio unit you want in your army. So use these guys on the flanks of your army. Could even form a battle line if you really want to use a lot of spearmen. Um, just excellent. Very, very nice. Good to use for online battles too. Girls! However, we then jump up to some really elite stuff. We then have the mercenary heavy Gallic Spearmen. Now, these guys don't require reforms to get to, so you might want to use these guys before the others, um, but they are mercenaries. You get them through your mercenary barracks. You have pretty friggin' fantastic stats across the entire board. Comparing them to your Furious unit, you have eight more armor, no javelin. Um, they are slower because of their heavy armor, but their attack is at eight, defense at 19. Charge bonus is kind of low at only 19 though. Um, but just wow, very, very solid unit. 200 men per unit though, so you do see that go down compared to 300, but you also get a lot of extra armor and some extra defense, so. Kind of depends on the situation. Having 300 men in a good unit is very nice, but these guys are also very nice. I'd kind of like to see them have one javelin, to be honest. Um, because they're not... The, I mean, they're a really good unit, but they're not amazing. I think a one javelin would be fair to them. Um, but, I mean, that's just my kind of opinion on, on the subject. We then, of course, have the Libby Phoenician Forex Spears. Um... Excellent Spearman unit. Very close to the uh, Sacred Band unit that we were looking at earlier. But they're just still on a level behind the Sacred Band. Especially in terms of uh, morale being at 49 compared to 56. They do have the same armor. Um, the attack of the uh, Thorax Spears is behind the Sacred Band as is the attack. Just... Yeah, very close to rivaling how good the um, Sacred Band is, but the Sacred Band is more of a hoplite unit, whereas these guys are a little bit more mobile, and they have the hollow square uh, formation, yourself! so that will help them against enemy cavalry and just be more defensive in we general. Understand. And they have the defensive formation ability. I don't really recommend using the defensive formation unless you really, really need extra morale and defense. But it surrounds your troops, or allows your troops to be surrounded very easy in a one-on-one -on -one engagement. Um, especially if you're facing a barbarian sword unit that has like 300 men. So you really need to be in the right position for that defensive formation to not bite you in the butt. But otherwise, just fantastic unit. Another unit that you'll be wanting to use in your armies on the flanks. Um, you could even provide a decent main front line with that as well. And they will last a very, very, very long time through that def uh, defense and morale. So, uh, and the armor, the armor being at 38 is pretty amazing. So that's all of your spears. A lot of options in the spear department, obviously. Um, now we'll move up to your swordsman. Now your swordsman um, is starting to take up a lot of time now. So I'll just kind of glance over your swordsman as quick as I can. We have some Libyan infantry swordsmen, basically levies. Mercenary Iberian Swordsmen, um, kind of deceptive in how they are kind of considered good, but also not really. They do have some guerrilla deployment, they do not have the stalk ability though. They can hide in grass and they can hide in scrub and forest, so they can be stealthy, but no stalk ability. 
kind of it makes it a little bit uh, deceptive their defense is really bad so don't expect them to last for long I don't recommend you use them a lot in your armies but they do have a javelin we then have the mercenary Skutari swordsman fantastic sword unit unfortunately only 200 men per unit but again we have guerrilla deployment um, they can hide fairly well as well a javelin each and just stats are very very solid um, and you don't have to wait until you get to the Florex reforms to get them so you may as well try to get them as quick as you can and use them in conjunction with your other mercenary units just really solid and going to be very helpful against Greek factions uh, I'm not sure how well they'll perform against Rome though as um, I'm not too sure about all of your swords but I mean it is nice to have swords to outflank the uh, Roman legionnaires and deal some damage from behind Orders, my lord. We then move on to your Libyan Furios infantry. Um, these guys are actually way behind those mercenary Scutari. So those Scutari should be kind of towards, not the end, but a little bit further on. Libyan yeah, let's move these two units. Scutari over there. These two units in here. Um, Libyan Furios infantry. Basically Furios swords, but only 15 armor. We then compare that to the Libby. Uh, Phoenician Thurios Infantry. Despite it saying Thurios, again, this unit is listed as being a Florex reform unit, and I kind of believe it because their armor is at 30. So I would expect these bad boys to be available after the Florex reforms, but when they do come in, um, they're very uniform, very disciplined, and basically they're going to make an excellent addition to any Carthaginian army. Ready to march. We then jump up to the Libby Phoenician Florax Swords. These guys are the ones that will go head to head against Roman Legionnaires. Um, they're equipped in the Roman Legionnaire style. So basically, these are the swordsmen that Hannibal relied on to hold the line at Cannae at the end of the battle, or towards the end of the battle as he kept them in reserve. These Libyan Phoenicians are excellent. Absolutely gobsmacking excellent. Very, very nice unit. Their main downfall though is a lack of a charge, so I wouldn't worry too much about getting them into a charge. And they don't have any formation, but they do have the discipline ability, so that will help them out. Swords! We then get to your best aggressive swords. When these are more of your best shock infantry, really. Um, mercenary Iberian champions. Just look at those face masks and body armor. Wow, pretty badass. Um, disgusting melee attack of 18 absolutely monstrous att attack their defense is quite low at nine although not too terrible charge bonus is only at 19 though which is kind of confusing to me i think they should be way higher on the charge bonus they're a shock infantry unit at least they come off as that way so i think they should be either given more charge bonus to reflect that or increase their defense slightly um give them a 10 or 11 perhaps weapon damage as well I mean, I would bump it up to at least a 28, maybe a little bit more. They do have the armor piercing damage as well, but I don't know. I would kind of like to see them be a little bit more focused towards being a shock infantry unit. And again, we do have the guerrilla deployment ability, but no stalk ability. Although they can hide relatively well if they are hidden. Um, as in, uh, if they are sitting still and hidden, so... Fantastic looking unit, very useful, but again, be aware of their armor piercing is not very high, nor is their charge bonus. So, um, try to give them some protection and let them get into a grind against Roman legionnaires if you can. Although the Roman legionnaire armor will help them survive against them. Anyway, that's it for your infantry. Let's try to get onto your cavalry and then we'll talk about your chariots and elephants. So for your cavalry, we start off with the Carthaginian Citizen Cavalry. Um, these guys are actually shock cavalry, uh, believe it or not. Um, some people use them and don't really realize that they are specifically just shock cavalry, but it is something to be aware of, especially in online battles. I've seen some people use these guys and kind of throw them away uh, because they don't realize their defense is pathetic at only four so that's really really low way too low in my opinion it shouldn't be that low i mean i understand why they keep it that low but i think it give them at least a six seven or an eight i mean eight might be a bit much kind of more into melee cab territory but man just 
The rest of their stats are so good, it's such a shame to see their defense be so low. Because they're not a lancer unit, they don't have a lance, they have a long spear that they use in combat. But they don't have a lance. Oh, a cav unit that does have a lance though is their brother, the Carthaginian citizen. Late cavalry version. Um, these guys do quite clearly have a lance, as you can see. Um, statistically, they're a little bit more aggressive. Um, just better all around, pretty much everywhere. And they also have the discipline uh, ability down here. So the morale is very good and they will um, be less likely to rat off the battlefield. So for Carthage, Shock Cavalry is one of the downfalls of Carthage. They don't have a lot. They obviously have this elephants and chariots so you know it's not like they're struggling in shock um, but it is worth mentioning like the Diadochi factions will have better shock having you um, as will some of the barbarians in eastern factions so that's something to consider in online battles and when you're getting a little bit later into your campaign and if you don't have elephants to go around for whatever reason but that's it uh, for your shock cavalry department cavalry! we then move on to your melee cavalry department um, we have some mercenary Iberian Cav, very solid despite it being a low tier kind of unit. Definitely very good for scouting um, and it can be useful for online battles as well. 120 men is nothing to scoff at and these guys are well armored at 23 so overall not bad. Give them a little bit of experience and they can be a force to be reckoned with. We then have the Libyan Cavalry which actually have less armor and morale um, but they have higher defense at 11. So these guys are kind of equal, although the Libyans also have 120 men and they have a resistance to heat, whereas the Iberians do not. But then we jump up to the Libby Phoenician Cavalry. Um, armor is disgusting at 38, that's just atrociously very, very good for a melee cav unit, especially just like, not an elite unit, but you know, pretty um, high tier one. Uh, attack is not amazing at 9, but it's still good. Defense at 15. They have a great charge at 48 for being a, just a melee cav unit. And their morale is at 49, so these guys will last quite a while in combat. Um, looking very, very good, of course. Libby Phoenician, so these guys do come from your Furious Reforms, as do pretty much all your Libby Phoenician units. I don't believe. Do any of these others do? Um, here, your Carthaginian citizen late cav come from your Thurios reform student. The, that's the cavalry unit that uses a lance. So sorry about that. Forgot to mention it. What about your swords? Did I mention it? I don't think I did actually. So let's just go over that very quickly. Libyan uh, Thurios swords obviously come from Libyan Thurios reforms. Your Libyan Phoenician uh, Thurios infantry come from your Florex reforms. Your and then command. your Libyan Phoenician uh, Florex swords obviously come from your Florex reforms as well. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, but anyway, getting back to your cavalry, Libyan Phoenicians come from Furious reforms. You then have the Carthaginian Sacred Band cavalry, excellent high tier melee cav unit. Although the stats aren't all that much better than the um, Phoenician uh, Libyan mix that you have. The main difference being that their armor is at 48 compared to uh, 45 compared to 38, sorry. So they are going to be slower, but they're going to be harder to kill. Um, so definitely worth trying to get those in your armies. You then have the Carthaginian Sacred late version, um, barely just a couple. Uh, stats difference between them does it really matter which one you want to use I mean you may as well get the late version why not um, but kind of depends on your uh, economy differences however the late variant only comes after the forex reforms but then we have your mercenary Iberian heavy cav and um, now these guys while they don't have the same armor as actually no they have better armor sorry I forgot about that uh, they have the best armor out of all of your other cav units that we've just covered. And their attack and defense is very, very good. Not really lacking in any department except abilities. So they don't have discipline or um, resistance to heat. And they are kind of slow. But man, these guys are very heavy. If you get them in a melee engagement against other cavalry, they will do very nice things for you. But they're quite expensive. And so, especially in something like an online battle, hard to get a lot of. But if you can get just one or even two of them, 
they man they can really swing the cavalry engagement in your favor just fantastic heavy unit um, and so quite obviously Carthage favors having melee cavalry units rather than shock in addition to rather than having skirmish in cav which is kind of confusing because the Numidian cavalry of Carthage are so famous yet Numidian cavalry! you really just get the one version I mean there is another version that's available um, if you recruit them from Numidia itself in Carthage in your African province you can get a uh, I believe it's an AOR variant of these guys um, but I mean, these guys are very good, but at the same time, I feel like they're a little bit overrated. I mean, they have a crap ton of abilities, which is very nice. They have a snipe ability, so they can uh, throw their javelins while hidden. Although it's unlikely they're going to be hidden while they're on horseback. Do you have the stalk ability? The only unit in your army that does so, so they can move around the battlefield without being seen. So that would make them very nice. Um, another kind of hidden thing about them, though, is that they have the ignore terrain ability where they have speed penalties caused by terrain uh, ignored so they can move as fast as they like anywhere on the battlefield so that's very nice guerrilla deployment is very nice and they have the Numidian horse one of the best horses in the game um, they aren't very big though uh, in addition the Numidians have no armor an armor of four so basically none so you're really relying on hit and run tactics from them you need to basically have them avoid taking any damage otherwise they're gonna die quite quickly so you can't really use them in melee engagements and expect them to do well at least not without throwing all their javelins first and they start off with an ammunition of nine javelins though, so that is a fair bit but still um, 120 men naked on horseback are not gonna do well in melee they will do well in skirmishing though so really make sure you're using them in the appropriate manner but that's it for your cavalry um, let's very quickly check what out your, your chariots orders? chariots still very hit or miss um, Carthage does have the scythe version as you can see right here so kind of like Pontus which is nice although these guys are very expensive still very very fragile as well um, and they don't have a second man in the chariot so they won't have any skirmishing potential um, but they do have four horses and they are being pulled by uh, with two um, scythes on either side so they can do massive damage just like elephants can but these guys are going to be way more fragile than elephants and I wouldn't bother using them against a player to be honest what I would use though is elephants um, you have the Carthaginian Atlas elephants you have three variants of them these guys are the best because they are the only variant that comes with a tower and a javelin mid on top so that will get you basically 50 extra kills or so per battle um, these guys are a little bit extra armor too with the armor around the uh, head you have the second variant of the elephants that have the same armor but the first variant of the elephants is literally just a naked elephant with a rider on top so if you can try to get this unit just because it will give you a little bit more bang for your buck a little bit more kills I mean but overall the African elephants for Carthage are not very good because they're not very big um, at least not as far as elephants go I mean they'll still be very helpful but if you put these up against ele uh, Indian elephants or Syrian elephants these guys will get romper stomped um, but if you use them the way you should which is to recharge enemy uh, blob formations or at least disrupt them before you charge in then you will do very well on the charge and get a lot of kills so um, both of these units can be quite helpful I personally prefer using elephants but if you're just doing like a single player campaign you may as well try the chariots out once or twice just to see how long they last in your army um, but again very expensive and still very fragile so be aware of that try to let them not take too much damage um but anyway that's it for the part two section of this video finally so let's very very quickly cover the verdict of Carthage because this video has been way too long already um and then we'll end it there so i'll see you guys at the verdict okay everybody here we are at the part three section of this video where we'll check out the verdict for Carthage. i'll make some final 
few noteworthy points about the faction and then we'll give the overall difficulty rating. Um, so first off, you are the arch rival of Rome. The majority of your early to mid and often your late uh, campaign uh, or errors of your campaign will revolve around dealing with Rome and Rome's allies. Um, Rome is going to be very strong, very hard for you to beat. You can try to rush them if you like and if you want a very easy campaign, rushing the capital, so taking Rome itself and at the very least liberating it or wiping it out, whatever you want to do to it, will give you a massive edge over taking on Rome as a faction in the future. However, it's not necessarily easy to try and rush their capital and I wouldn't recommend it, it ruins a lot of the fun. Um, but just do keep in mind, despite uh, Total War games allowing a lot of freedom of choice in Total War Rome 2 and in DEI especially, Carthage is kind of forced into war with Rome, at least at some point in your campaign. You also need to consider the fact that you need to beat them to other areas of the Mediterranean. For example, they will go to Greece very, very quickly once they beat Epirus. You can't really beat them to it unless you really try, so I wouldn't bother. But you, what you might want to try to beat them to is Iberia, or perhaps even trying to beat them into northern Italy. If you want a foothold uh, on some land territory close to Italy, try to invade the Po Valley area before they do, such as entering uh, via Liguria. Uh, might be a good idea for you if you do want to kind of landlock Italy or the Romans in. Um, not going to be easy, mind you, but it is possible. However, despite this, you are in a pretty safe position, at least strategically you are. You have your navy protecting your core territory. Your navy, while it's not the best in the entire campaign, it is still solid. It's better than the Roman navy in a... At least early on it is, as the Romans get more reforms, they will get stronger overall, so watch out for that. Uh, but your ships are bigger and constructed better. Use that to your advantage and try to use your navy to destroy their armies, because often the AI will not escort their armies with navies. And then that's going to be an easy win for you. You can wipe out an entire army for literally zero losses. However, because you are in the position you are, you are also very decentralized. You're prone to being drawn into wars on multiple fronts. For example, probably within the first 5-10 to 10 turns, you will have war in Sicily, Africa, and potentially towards Iberia as well. It kind of depends on how you play things, who you get uh, trade agreements with and whatnot. But you do have factions that are very prone to attacking you. Cyrenaica is a bit of a surprise one. Uh, the Garamantians to your southeast are also very prone to attacking you and they will cause you issues, you can't ignore them. Rome is obviously a big one, Syracuse will also want to declare war on you, and if you're playing as the Barakid faction, all of these factions will have diplomatic penalties against you, so they're not going to like you unless you can kind of convince them uh, to like you. So you'll see the same thing in Iberia, most of the Iberians do not like you, and as a result, you may see wars develop very quickly, especially if you're playing on hard difficulty or above. And then there's one last final point that I think some people may not consider, but it could really help you out in the long run. And that is, I think you should consider ignoring Sicily entirely. Um, if you don't take it, the Romans won't come and knock on your doorstep as quickly as they otherwise would. Uh, they'll still declare war on you and still send armies and fleets overseas, but it will take a lot longer. And if you don't have a landmass connected to Rome in some way, because Sicily is connected to Rome, um, they have a land crossing uh, in the northeastern tip of Sicily to Italy, um, the Romans will struggle to try and pinpoint where they want to attack you. So you'll see their armies coming from very far away. You'll see them trying to sail across the sea towards Corsica and Sardinia. Sometimes to Africa, or typically they'll try to take your islands first. Um, so leaving Sicily alone, while it isn't great to lose those two cities there, it's not the worst thing in the world. And if you do leave Sicily alone, you can then landlock the Sicilian factions into Sicily, use your better navy to lock them in, and basically stonewall the Romans and allow you time to either dedicate your armies elsewhere into Africa and Iberia, or just give you time to build tall. You might want to do that. You already have plenty of territory as it is. You need a lot of time and money to build it up to get you into a very powerful position. 
So it's just something that is worth considering. And I know a lot of people who play Rome 2 don't really like the idea of ever losing a war. Despite many of us wanting more difficulty, losing a war typically means that you either lose a campaign or you lose a lot of territory. In this instance, it's not really necessary because you're Carthage, you have a lot to lose. So that's okay. Let a little bit of it go. You can always come back later on and retake certain uh, losses. And it kind of gives into a little bit of historical accuracy as well because Carthage did eventually lose Sicily um, in the first initial engagements against Rome. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, after considering this very long faction overview and all of my points, pros and cons of Carthage, and in also reviewing the previous faction overview I did for Carthage, we're coming in with a difficulty rating, which I'm bumping up a little bit just by two points from the previous rating, to a total of 5 out of 10. I think Carthage is a very average difficulty rating faction. It has its pros, it has its cons, it can potentially be a pretty easy campaign, and it can potentially be a very hellish campaign. It can be very difficult. Um, and that really just depends on how the AI reacts to you and how they target you. Carthaginian campaigns are very versatile and while you'll see some similar patterns, it also kind of depends on how well the AI handles fighting you. So for example, playing against uh, like the Iberians, the Iberians might just send one army against you and then they're too busy fighting with each other. So though, even though you've had three or four Iberian factions declare war on you, it might not be the end of the world. But if they aren't fighting each other, then you're in some serious trouble. You're going to lose your Iberian positions very quickly, and then they'll start invading uh, the Mauritanian region. So it really just depends on so many kind of small factors that combine into giving this overall difficulty rating, in my opinion. Um, you do have really big advantages as well. Like I said, you can keep Roma Bay with your navy for a long time. Not forever, mind you. They will catch up to you in terms of naval supremacy. But you can keep them at bay and you can get a lot of very big victories very, very easily. I'd really like to know what you guys think of Carthage in its current state. Is there any changes that you would like to see for Carthage? If so, comment them down below and I would love to have some discussions with you all. So so anyway, before we end the video though, I just want to give a very specific and sincere shout out to the channel members of our channel. That is Stefan Parrot, Evernight, and HK. I sincerely appreciate your financial support to the channel, gentlemen. Um, if you yourself would like to be a channel member, there is a link in the description of all of my videos where you can go ahead, click that button, see the benefits of becoming a channel member, support the channel, and support more content being created and more upgrades to the channel occurring as they are desperately needed but i need support to make that happen so anyway consider becoming a channel member today link in the description below but anyway ladies and gentlemen thank you all so much for watching hope you guys enjoyed and i shall see you in the next one